God just wants to be believed. How do you like that? Simple, isn't it? We don't lie. There's no lies in him. He, he can't. It's, he's, he's just perfection, and he can't lie. So whatever he says is absolutely true. If you don't understand it, that don't make him a liar. We need to grow up. That's what it really boils down. We need to do research. When you don't understand, where do you go? That's where you go. You go there. Because there's a story in there for you somewhere every time. Every time. Can't say enough good things about him. I was looking for words this morning, couldn't find any. Because he's just too perfect and too great. And I've never known anybody like him. And I've never seen him. But I've seen him in my heart. Do you ever try to describe love? <laughs> you ever try to describe somebody you really love? Thank you, God, that you're so you're just so loving and kind toward us. And, and you're perfection, and we're imperfection, and you still deal with us every day. You never withhold your love. You never withhold your help. We have to walk away from it. Thank you for your kindness this morning. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. All right. Faith. You know, we're talking about rest still. This is the last day to talk about rest. But I, I can't talk about rest without talking about faith because you can't rest if you don't have any faith. <laughs> if you don't have faith, you don't have rest. And uh, rest, rest means you're able to give God the, the responsibility of taking care of you. And most of us try to take care of ourselves and then we get tormented because we're trying to be our own God. We try to fix everybody. We try to fix everything. And uh, we're trying to do everything ourselves. And that, that's not trust, you know. It, isn't it funny how it sticks out in all your relationships, too? Your human relationships are a reflection of it also. Anyway, so this, this is kind of like God's goal, you know. To, uh, this is, God is all about relationship, and his goal is to take you on a journey where you get to know him and trust him more. So uh, what's the cause of the lack of rest? It's a lack of faith in God, Okay. Shambach used to put it that way. He'd say, you don't have a problem, you just need faith in God. But that sounds good until you know what faith is. Faith is trust. Um, we all believe in something. Your belief system is a product of what you have listened to. You realize that? Your, your belief system is a product of what you have put in your ears. Um, you know, we're, the world obviously is going into a place it's never been before. If information comes so quickly that, uh, you know, there's there's ton, there's so much information. I, I forget the statistic, but we're we're getting more information that would take a life, you know, several lifetimes to get. If you're going to do the math, math, it's way past what we can we can comprehend. There's a battle for your mind. So who's going to who's going to have your head? That's what you have to decide. Who's going to have your head? It's what you have put in your ears is what's going to be in your head. The battle between God's word and the devil's word started in Genesis, which I always use Genesis for a lot of sermons because I like the law of first things. And, you know, I look at, I'm a principled thinker. I'm not a situational thinker. And what's funny, when you're principled, some people don't know that they think you're not looking at the problem or the behavior of other people. But see, I got to gauge them. I got to reference them from what I know is true, which helps me decide what to do with them. So if I look at them, I'll think, my mind will want to think things. But if I use the principles in Scripture to, to measure what I see, I see something different. My view is different because... It's kind of like I'm not looking through rose-colored glasses. I'm looking through word-colored glasses. The word defines it. And you got to hear. That way you can hear and see what, what's behind things. It's not the behavior. It's what's behind it. 
So who's going to have your head? You have to decide that. The, the battle for God's word to be removed from people's hearts started in Genesis. The devil said, uh, you know, did God say not to eat of every tree? And obviously he questioned God, which begins a doubt. I've talked on this a couple weeks ago. And after he questioned it, uh, you could tell Eve added to it. She said, not only can't we eat it, but we, we are not supposed to touch it. Yet I don't see that in the scripture. Not that I think you should touch the tree you're not supposed to eat, but she added words. So there was a, devi a, a deviation, a, a, vari a variance, an added to. So the devil, once he opens the door for doubt, once you open the door, he will begin to lie. He said immediately after that, he said, uh, you, shall, you shall not surely die. That was a blatant lie. After he created doubt, he came with a lie. That's why if you don't gird up your ears quick, if you don't uh, gird yourself up quickly, you'll, you'll have openings. And it's going to look like you're just being narrow-minded, but what you're doing is you're protecting your heart. Proverbs 4 says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. So what you open yourself up to, there's, there's so many battles in the mind. I'm just going to hit two. One of them, it could be a blatant lie. And the other one, it could be something that's in you that likes to sin that you heard and it looks enticing. I mean, literally, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. When you watch something or hear something, it'll open the door for something you're not supposed to get. Now, that sounds very narrow-minded, but you got to know your kryptonite, as T.D. Jake says. What... Where are your weaknesses? And if you're proud, you'll never admit they're there, which leaves you unprotected because you won't admit where you are, so you can't be protected where you need cover. That's, that's what coverings do, is coverings protect you from where your weaknesses are until you keep getting rid of them, till you grow and mature. That's why when you get new Christians, they belong prayed for, covered, discipled, and taken care of because... They're vulnerable. They brought all their baggage into the world and they, they might have pornography, drugs, whatever it is they do, whatever their issues are, drinking. It doesn't really it doesn't even matter what they are. You know that, right? They're all, they're all the same. No temptation is new. It doesn't matter what topic. We all have different propensities. So that's why, you know, there's almost like an incubation time when you get born again where you almost got to get away from everything. Actually, even to figure out what your weaknesses are and what you what you lust for that you're not supposed to have you hear me that's why fasting is about that's what separating yourself for time is about most of us stay so busy we don't know that we have all these weaknesses we just know we have baggage but we don't know necessarily what they are until you try to stop doing them and i have found that when you don't deal with yourself you criticize others all the time there's something about, not, when you look at yourself, you get so disgusted, you really don't have nothing else to say to other people. You quit becoming a critic of everyone because you finally saw yourself, and it's very humbling to look at yourself for who you really are. All of a sudden, the criticism goes away. You're not fixing nobody no more. You're not thinking what they should be doing anymore. You have found a way to keep yourself busy, and, and you're a big project, you know. So... The battle between God's word and the devil's word has gone on since Genesis. And even when Moses was going to deliver the Israelites by God's power, he had 10 confrontations. Every time he'd make a statement, the devil would retaliate 10 times. So for us to think the devil's not going to retaliate is really a, an ignorant principle of Scripture. When you hear a promise, you can expect the thief to come to steal it. You can expect the thief to come. If it's a true promise from God, here you go. I'll give you one example. You know, this is, I'm, I, I can use me if I brought out you, then everybody know when you're telling your business. I ain't going to do it. I'm teasing. But when, when we were going to, I was supposed to begin a church. 
It was in the early 90s. And uh, Rena has a dream. She says, Joe, I saw you in a skirt down to here, like a shepherd's skirt, and a staff. She says, you were on a mountain over here. The sheep were over here. And there was a bunch of sheep, and they had faces of people we knew, if I'm not mistaken. These sheep had faces, and it was all the people that were supposed to be in our church. In between it, there's a gulf, okay? In the gulf, a huge serpent comes out of the ground and has a mange on it like a lion and goes, and separates me from the sheep in her vision. We didn't start the church till like 98. There was five years of warfare, maybe six, to even get there. I mean, big time warfare, not a little stuff. Big time. Uh, I, I've told you this before, but it don't matter. I mean, I had to move my business. We went on a mission trip, got all beat up. I lost all kind of money in, in the business for a while, couldn't buy any cars. Wound up moving to Fairmont in the midst of a snowstorm. The, 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 the interstate. When 93 was like a washboard, it froze over for like a month. How many remember the 93 snow all over the place kept you busy? We had so many obstacles to getting that started. And, uh, you know, there was so much. That, that serpent roared and roared and roared for like five or six years. That was just to even get somebody saved and start the church. It took that long to deal with. See, when you get your promise... Could you handle a six-year battle? I got longer than that and some other ones. I really do. No joke. Some people can't last six days, six weeks, six hours. But you're gonna have, you might have a decade in one battle. So to start that church, that mangy thing come up out of there. And I had to contend with it. And the whole time what was happening to me is I was learning to die. That's what I was learning. Because I was violated, misunderstood, felt like I was lied about. All, uh, my motives were all questioned. But I, all of those were siftings to clean me up. Isn't that interesting? But the devil come to sift, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, Peter. That's what it is. When you get something and you get sifted, you'll usually accuse somebody else if you don't like the sifting of holding you back or they don't, you don't like what they're doing to you. But you have no idea God is scrubbing you. You're getting the scrubbing. You think the people are in your way, and it's you that are getting the scrubbing. Brushes, brushes, wire. Sometimes you use wire brushes on things, you know. It can be pretty painful to get scrubbed up. So, we got a word, and then we had a fight. We got a word, and we had a fight. There were so many warnings and so many things. I, I ain't going to get into them all. I've gone forever on that. Everything we've ever done, the devil, the devil attacks me when he knows it's coming. Now, I can't tell you theologically how I know this. I'm going to make a statement, but I'm not going to be able to tell you why. Anytime something gets released from heaven or is coming my way, I go through the most extreme attacks family health money whatever works it's like he just pulls out the plethora of darts he's got about 50 of them he don't know which one's going to stick so he just starts throwing them till he finds the one that works because he's not omniscient he's not omni you know he doesn't know everything so he sometimes he can just throw the barrage to see what works every word of god really can't you see they tried to kill Jesus? They tried to kill Moses. It's so obvious that the devil wants to kill it before it starts. That's why when you get a word, I personally believe you should go like this with that word. Just tuck it away in your heart. Don't be like Joseph and tell everybody you're going to be this, you're going to be that. Keep it in your heart. Let it get stronger. Let it be cultivated. If you're going to be in business, let it be cultivated. If you're going to have a good marriage, guess what? God's going to come in and rip it up. Because it's built wrong anyway, so he's got to tear it up. 
Anything you get a word for, there's going to have to be shifting, changing, remodeling, and death. Sounds great, don't it? How many, come on up, let's have an altar call. How many want that in your life? Right now, get up here quick. <laughs> I want to die, kill me. <laughs> Make me miserable for six, for six months till I get a change, till I get this worked out of my character. After a while, you know what? You will pray that prayer. You believe that? When you learn, when you have a few experiences of the dying and the victory, the cross becomes your friend, not your enemy. Because you know, unless a corn of wheat fall into the ground to die, it abides alone. Your multiplication of the effectiveness of your life as a Christian is in the death of your selfishness. That's how you get there. That's why I always say everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants money, but nobody wants to work. Everybody wants good health, but they want to eat what they want. It don't, they don't mix. When we went on that first missions trip, we come back and laid around wounded in the house, depressed, because we thought, is that what it's really like? Oh, man. She laid on the couch. I had to go to work, but she laid on the couch. What well, were on the couch? Didn't dress for the day. On a robe on the couch. Depressed. Depressed. Want to quit? Because it wasn't what we thought it was going to be. <laughs> it was totally different than we had imagined in our mind. And we just started to figure out, hey, this is serious business. And that, be, that was a long time ago. Long, long time ago. And we started to learn what we, what we had to die to. And that your life, your, gra your life gradually becomes not your own. It is no longer I that live, but the life I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of Man who loved me and gave his life for me. And until... Until you're willing to let go of what you perceive is your dream marriage, your dream ministry, your dream stuff, you ain't going to get it. Because what you imagine is rarely what he's going to give you. It's better. See, in your mind, it's what you could imagine. But in, his, in the real world, it's what God's plan is for your life. And it is so much greater because... If he helped you, if he did you where you're at, that's all the higher you'd get. God tries to pull you up so he can give you what's up there because that's where it is. And if you stay down here and you get what you want, it's not enough. It's not enough. I'm going to skip this stuff here and go straight to Abraham. Okay? Oh, uh, I still got to do Noah. Noah. <laughs> Well, I mean, the relationship. Everything, the whole Bible is a relationship book. When you read it from that, you see it differently. God wanted to have a relationship with the world, but he had one with Noah. Okay? And the Bible says that Noah, Genesis 6, 7, uh, excuse me, 7, Genesis 6, just read it, 6, 14. If you would put it up there, Genesis 6, 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in it, the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. Now we'll go to verse 7. I mean, chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 7, verse 5. 7, 5. And Noah did according all that the Lord commanded him. He, gave, he told him at once, and he did it once, immediately. No negotiations. <laughs> No postponements. No, I'll think about it. No was already positioned. He loved God enough to just obey him. Now remember, that's one guy out of the whole world, and the rest of the world got drowned, and Noah's faith saved his family, because that's what it says in Hebrews. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, moved with fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his house, the world, in other words, if it wasn't for Noah, everybody else wouldn't have survived either. God took one guy, and everybody survived. It matters who you attach yourself to. You just get in on the fringes sometimes 
Just It's kind of like when Pastor Reen used to say she could prophesy around Dr. John and Rebecca, but couldn't prophesy when she got away from them. She was living on the fringes of their anointing. And when you're young, this is what happens when you're young. These are the siftings. This is just one. You think because you did it, you got it, and you're equal, and you can do it too. But what you don't put together is if you ever got out of the house, it'll dissipate. Because it's connected to what you're connected to. Until you develop your own well. Okay? When you develop your own well, then you have your own anointing. Which is what God, that's the whole goal is to, for God to make you mature. So Noah did exactly what he said. And uh, he realized Noah saved the world, you know, through the lineage. There wouldn't have been any of this. So, so teaching people to trust is God's ultimate goal. Because trust and faith are married. So when God begins, what, what you think, or all the experiences you think you're having that are good, bad, and indifferent, and you don't like them, I will tell you that what's in your heart will take you into the places that you go, and there your battles are. And that, you, those experiences are how you see God's power. A Abraham, Genesis 12, 1 and 2. There's seven things that happen just in two, two sentences. Now the Lord said to Abram, number one, get out of your country from your family. I'll stop there and preach just a minute. Until you separate yourself from what you're supposed to be separated from, you don't get the next step. And from your family. And from your father's house. Number two, I'm going to show you the land that I'm going to give you. After you separate, if you don't separate, I'm not showing you anything. See, I read the word frontwards and backwards. And I will, now he's going to tell him what he's going to do. Number three, I will make you a great nation. Number four, I'm going to bless you. Hallelujah. I will make your name great. That's another thing. Hallelujah. I will make your name great. And you sh then now he's telling him, and you're going to be a blessing to the world. Okay? I will bless those that bless you. In other words, the people around you that treat you good, I'm going to take care of them too. Amen. Then he says, I'm going to curse those that curse you. Wow. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You realize he made him seven, seven statements, right? Okay. Now, isn't that, isn't that all wonderful? How does that make you feel? Makes you feel real good, don't it? First thing, though, Abraham gets up and goes, and he runs into a famine. Now, remember, he's supposed to be blessed, but the first thing he runs into is lack. First thing. And he's so fearful based, he has a pretty wife. And he tells her, I'm going to lie about you, and I'm telling you before we get there, because they're probably going to kill me because you're so pretty. So he had a famine and a pretty wife. It don't sound real good, does it? He's worried about dying because his wife's good looking because he's afraid somebody's going to kill him to take her. So now that his, his fears were revealed in his first experience with God. He moved because of the promises, but the promises took him to a place where he had to deal with his fears. See, we think we're waiting, like we're going to skip all the programs and, you know, we're going to get what we want. You're all dreaming. <laughs> so if you avoid the fear of what you're afraid of and won't do, you're avoiding the promise. First thing he does is deliver him from fear. He lies about Sarah. And you know how lies find you out? That's why you should never lie, because they do find you out. Uh, God visits the king. He goes, don't touch her. I kill you. Well, he tells Abraham, why did you do this? And he said, I'm afraid. And God gives him all the cattle and the money, and that guy tells him, get out of town and take your stuff with you. God pays for your classes is what I'm trying to tell you. Some people complain about their job, but they don't realize God gave them that job so he can teach them something, and they keep looking for the benefits, and they're missing the lesson. I'm telling you, you miss the lessons when all you do is whine. 
God gives you a job, in my opinion, if you take the right ones, to, div- to show you what you don't know about yourself, and you keep wanting to chase better money or something better, but what he's doing is God's got this long-term plan to make you into the man he wants you to be, and he can't do it until he begins to reveal to you where you are so he can get you cleaned up and you could alter, change, change and become what he wants you to become. So if you don't obey the first instruction, you probably won't get the second. Now, Abraham departs from there and he gets another visitation. In verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto him and uh, he said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and had a, appeared to him. His obedience brought another visitation after the first one. So if he wouldn't have done the first one, he wouldn't have got the second visitation. He'd have just been wandering around like all the people in the desert did or thinking, I'll be something someday. But until he obeyed a second, he didn't, until he obeyed, he didn't get the second. Okay? Some people think God ain't talking. And I always wonder... Are you listening or did you obey the last thing? And if you didn't, if you did and he hasn't spoke, he's not ready to talk about it yet. Because the Lord made you. He knows how to communicate with every one of you. He made you. So he says, I'm going to give you this land. But I said the first thing he's run into is fear, famine, and scared. Now, Abraham, what happened was, I said, he heard, but he didn't trust God, so he lied. How many of you didn't trust God and lie. This happens to you. You can lie to yourself. He did not know God yet, but he was going to have an experience so God could reveal himself to him. Famine, like I said, pretty wide and promise. So, God's response to Abraham, he tells him, your descendants will be. Hallelujah. He's beginning to get to know God. 